Welcome, everybody. This is the Handheld Book Club, and we are going to be talking about Kingdoms of Elfin by Sylvia Townsend Warner. But first, I'm going to introduce our guests. First, I'm Kate McDonald. I run Handheld Press. To my right on my screen, we have Greer Gilman. Greer, could you put your hand up so we can wave? That's Greer. Greer wrote the foreword to our edition of Kingdoms of Elfin. Greer is a notable fantasy author whose publications include this, Cloud and Ashes, and also Exit Pursued by a Bear and Cry Murder in a Small Voice. This is my favourite one. We also have Ingrid Hotz Davis, who is Chair of English Literature at the University of Tumingen. Ingrid, could you wave your hand? Ingrid wrote the introduction to our edition of Kingdoms of Elfin. And I'm going to switch to speaker mode now so that we can see only the people who are making noises, which is another very good reason for people keeping their microphones off, because otherwise you will be inadvertently having your dog bark or your cat move. So can we start with a couple of questions? Greer, can I ask yeah. you? El I'm, I'm going to quote from what you wrote in your foreword. All right. Um, Elfins are unknowable, a cloud of bright particularities, or particles, perhaps, with charm and strangeness, perhaps huons, which is a very good joke about huon of elfin. Their otherness is sharp. If only you could pin it down, they are unshadowy as lightning. So I was wondering, can you expand on this idea of elfins as elemental particles? This idea that elfins are amongst us and part of us, or is it not? Is maybe not, not what you meant? Maybe part of us. Um, I think... I think that Warner is unusual in this. Um, she does not go for, oh, the common idea of phase as shadowy mm -hmm. or um, diffuse. They're, they're like lightning. They're quick, bright, somewhere else, you know, now, here, nowhere. And um, I think this is something that I uh, I see in Warner. She is very taken with the thing as it is. Uh, one of her phrases is everything exactly as it is. That's what she liked to write about. Um, there's a bit when she's describing um, the spring um, in Brocéliande. Um, there was nothing striking about it except itself. Mm -hmm. um, she is very concerned with the magic of now, here, this moment, um, brightly lit precision. Um, I, I just thought of this um, just before I switched on, but she is concerned with um, uh, unusually a very scholastic thing, Hyxiety, the thisness of things, um, <laughs> which, is, which is the word that, that um, um, Gerard Manny, Manley Hopkins used, and she's not an ecstatic like him, but she's very, very taken. Uh, I just was looking through the letters before we started, and she was being pleased with France because the landscape was exactly as it was. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I think that's magic to her. Uh, yeah. I hope I'm not I'm not running on too much, but I think I think that is the source of her magic is the sharp, bright particularness of things. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if that's got something to do with her idea that for well, the elfins, the fairies live for a very, very long time. So concentrating on the now gives them some kind of anchorage because they have a long life to live and it could just drift away if they don't pin themselves down into it well yeah as, as we were talking about in the preliminaries the pandemic is a loss of time it's almost like being well uh, ironically it's uh, for those of us who still live it's like being an immortal there's nowhere to pin down mm. there's no there's no people you're meeting with so uh I think I, I fell into um, I fell into um, Sylvia Townsend Warner actually ironically before she'd written any um, Elfin mm -hmm. stories I fell into her in the late 60s 
And uh, the one I fell, uh, the, uh, the story I fell in love with was A Spirit Rises, which mm -hmm. is autobiographical. She's talking about her father who was a master at Harrow. Uh, and she was jealous of his students because she didn't get time with him. And he used to read on a rocking horse, sit in his study and read on a rocking horse. And she, in the story, she's taken up onto his lap before him on the horse and they're rocking and he's reading her um, from Elizabeth Barrett Browning, um, mm -hmm. uh, The Swan's Nest. And just as the rocking horse kept measure, just as the rain fell in order to be silver, the voice went on in order to be poetry. It was familiar and made itself unknown. And I think that's, and I saw that, okay, she's on the edge of magic. She is a person in whose cool, unemphatic company magic is about to happen because you're not, because it, it's particular, it's there. It's magic in the now and here, magic in the moment. And she's all, even in her um, mimetic story, she's always on the edge of that. I just wanted to ask Ingrid. Ingrid, can you? Because I'm, I'm, I'm hogging this. Yes. No, no, no. Ingrid, hang on. Please. No, it, Greer has told us when she first discovered Sylvia. Ingrid, when did you first discover Sylvia? Actually, that's a long time ago. And I came to her via Stevie Smith. Uh huh. Uh, as a young, very young person, you know, in, in yeah. Uh, very, very young, right? I fell in love with Stevie Smith. And I think, again, with a particularity that is somehow unparaphrasable, right? That somehow uh, paraphrasing a Stevie Smith poem doesn't get you the poem, right? Uh, and mm. I think paraphrasing a, a Townsend Warner story doesn't get you the Townsend, the, the story, right? And um, and then I um, the, I started with, like, like everybody, I think, with Lolly Willows and... Um, and the ability, its ability to make you long for conditions that you didn't even know you longed for. You know, I don't think I'd ever thought that I really would want to live in a ditch, mm. right? But it's a, it's a novel that made me want to do exactly that. And I thought, oh, how ingenious is this? Yes, 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 please let me go away to Great Pop and start living in a ditch, right? And then the next one I read was then The Corner That Held Them, right? And um, I found that hard going because, uh, it's exactly the kind of story where, in a way, nothing happens. Yes, things happen, right? Church towers get built, church towers collapse, um, daily life happens, right? Uh, and it happens, and it happens, and it happens, and it all seems to be on a kind of a continual plane of nowness somehow. So the centuries pass, and you're continually now, right? As if history didn't, didn't happen. And from there, of course, you know, I, there was no stopping, right? And I ended up reading. I don't think I've read everything she ever wrote, but uh, certainly quite a lot, right? And I discovered the Kingdoms of Elf and then rather late, um, um, but I was immediately taken by this, by the fact that she'd taken yet another completely new turn that I hadn't seen coming, right? So if you've read a lot of Townsend Warner, obviously you, you, you're not, it's not that it's completely out of character. It is in character, very much in character, like a summation of everything that we've had, right? Um, but it's so, so stunning, right? And so masterly, you get the sense that every single word is exactly where it sh should be. And the, the as Greer just said, you know, the, the, the precision, the, 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 the kind of attention that is being paid to minute details, and those details aren't symbolic or allegorical or anything like this, right? They don't mean beyond themselves, they're just there. And you're being allowed to watch this, like the the, the yeah. before um, tonight. I ended up rereading some of her stories. I didn't have enough time, so I thought, am I going to read my my own preface or uh, uh, introduction? Or am I going to read some stories? Now that I'm going to read some stories, right? <laughs> much more fun. And um, and this and I was again struck again at the the how someone can make art, real art, out of being cool detached right I, I read her very much as a as a writer who asks again and again the question for example how can people be free right? yeah, how yeah. can we how can we if at the same time we somehow live with each other right so how can we prevent each from from ourselves and each other from enslaving each other right and how can we 
how can we have freedom in something like love right which is probably the most the most possessive mm -hmm. um and and ownership claiming uh, kind of condition to be in right and all of it observed with this cool ethnographic eye right and then you get these different populations you get humans and you get fairies and they they're alien to each other, but they're also similar to each other so that they mirror each other in complicated ways. Right? And you get to follow the mirror and you get to follow both of these sides and it's, there's so much to do. And I think that for a reader, there's just so much to do. In your and, introduction, you do pick up the ethnographic idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, 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 I also in my, in my preface, uh, I said in some ways, the elfins are the backside of our weaving. Mm -hmm. It's it's um it's not only reversed as it in is in a mirror. There are very strange knots back there, um, but yes to the dispassion. Yes to the no. I said a uh, fugue because it's it's a pun on her being uh, a musician, but she's not in flight from anything. Um, I think she's like. Uh, Lolly Willows, who um, was tired, I mean, talk about captivity, she was being a maiden aunt, which is pretty much life as an occasional table, and she flees that, and she flees to a village, and then she lets, and then she flees even further, as you said, living in a ditch, she is living the life almost of a tree that, oh, right, I let my leaves go. I am one of the leaves. I let myself go. I drift. I, I sleep anywhere I land. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, and she kind of looks at the devil and said, no, that's not what, it's not about contracts. It's mm -hmm. not about service. I've had it with service. It's about freedom. <laughs> And, and I think uh, um, uh, Sylvia uh, is very good at imagining they're not escapes, right? They're, they're thought horizons, right? Um, where, where else could I go? Right? Uh, upon a stroke of midnight, for example, right? We have- Oh, oh uh, yes. Right, we have this woman and she keeps drifting further and further what seems to be away Right, so that in ordinary parlance, we probably send someone from the social services after her and say, oh, can we please look after you, right? Um, but in, in a way that her world is also an upside downish world so that, so that uh, things that we might in ordinary um, everyday social usage um, think of something that we should maybe feel sorry for, right? She won't let us feel sorry for it. Actually, she might make us long for it, right? That's a story that makes me long to I think that I think, yes, yes, the best thing you can do is move away altogether and live in some, you know, uh, dilapidated, I think she lives in some sort of van or container uh, uh, place, right? And uh, with only a cat and in the end, not even the cat. And in the, end, in the end, there's the flood. And yes, let the flood take me. Good idea. <laughs> right? it's, 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 there's always the next, the, next, the, the, next, the next point on the horizon as something that you can contemplate, right? that you can think about. And it's not suicidal. And I just know that my students would say, oh my god, she wants to commit suicide. And I would say, no, this is not it. Right? It's something else. right? Yes, at the end of the story, there's death. Um, but that is itself a, a, a stage of a, of, a, of a development, of a logical development of detachment, right? And of being for a while attached and then removing from that as well. And that is maybe that particular story's notion of freedom, right? And each of these stories has a different notion of freedom, right? Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's so, so for me, it's like an elixir, right? If you get if you get bogged down, um, read some of her stories and get, get your ideas opened up in terms of what you can think in terms of how you might be free. Yeah. There's um, a problem with a lot of detachment is that there, as Ingrid said, the moral, moral values and the sense of poetic justice are, are missing. If you have complete profound detachment, if the characters in the fairy elfin stories are detached completely. Where are the moral values? Where is the where are the absolutes of right and wrong? What rules do they 
can they be judged by or should we not judge them? Is that another element of the freedom that we are being faced with? Well, I guess I put the idea up, so I should probably answer uh, that, um, that question. Um, it, are these stories immoral, right? Uh, as mm. stories, right? Um, I think moral, uh, the moral of the stories actually must reside in the eye of the reader. I think mm. that uh, they don't give us, they don't tell us what to think or how to evaluate something as either either moral or not moral otherwise, right? Um, and I think um, many readers' reactions to the stories also give us different versions of exactly that, where readers might be tempted to import a moral that maybe isn't even there, right? But that for them should be there. And I don't think the stories prevent that. I think they, by, by making us observers of two sets of different worlds, and not just two, because every single story actually invents a different kind of elfin world, right? So, so, <laughs> so each of, so, so, so there's not one elfin world, right? There is one for each of these stories, very often also with different settings and so on. And the humans that surround them are differently positioned historically and, and, and socially and so on. And I think we watch them interact or not interact and mirror each other and the stories don't tell us what to think. Yes. And very often, and very often, we find that the two sides don't understand each other, and then we can decide whether we think this is tragic or not tragic. I tend to think it's not tragic, right? Because somehow yeah. um, they don't depend on each other; these two communities, right? Um, but I think I'm, I'm perf perfectly willing to accept that other readers might um, orient themselves differently. Right. But I think it leaves it, 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 it poses the question to you, right? So you become one of the observers. And I think it invites you to become a kind of a Townsend Warnerish type of observer, right? <laughs> Not someone who already immediately knows before they've looked what they think that they've always thought, right? But someone who has this curiosity to say, oh, well, hmm, I want to look at this first. Hmm, the upper class fairies don't want to use their wings. Hmm. Now, the lower class fairies do, so they fly around, which gives them a happiness that the upper classes don't have. Should I calculate this back into what I know of the social classes or shouldn't I and so on, right? Should I make these decisions or shouldn't I? And I think that gives these texts, every single one of them, this enviable openness, right? This, what it, what it, and I think it does that by blocking, uh, a kind of a knee-jerk reaction with which we very often read through processes of identification. I think she blocks identification quite consciously. So I don't think it happens yeah, very yeah. often, certainly not in these stories that you want, want to sit down and say, I'll feel with you, or I'll imagine I am you or something like this. I think you're always kept in this middle distance, right? And that is what that is probably where the morality then happens or doesn't. Greer, what do you think? Yeah, um, I was going to say on, on, the, on the subject of curiosity, um, uh, actually my copy of Kingdoms of Elfin falls open at the spring cleaning. A mysterious pair of spectacles is found in a sauce boat. A rusty strong box in the muniment room is forced open and contains nutmegs. When the brown bed hangings from the librarian's bedchamber are hung on the line and the dust beaten out of them, they are discovered to be cloth of gold and fall to pieces. And that is what curiosity does. It discovers things to be cloth of gold. It transforms them and that is their dissolution. And that's, I think, what happens to, to grieve um uh in oh lord lost the name of the story now um but he is the fairy whose mother is mad for birds and he is yes, yes neglected and he is he has a, a relationship with um the changeling servant um mm -hmm. gobele and in the end they go off together again, escaping. There's plague, there's famine. They go off together and become characters in a fantasy story, characters in a picaresque, but all the time they're heading 
towards Greaves apotheosis. I mean, there's a there's a beautiful, horrible scene. It's it's almost a Vidian, where he is simultaneously discovered and destroyed by bird life. He is he becomes a crown of beating wings um, before the very end of him. And it's like something out of Ovid. There's not there's not this. I'm telling you a story because it has a moral or Christian moral. Uh, I'm telling you because this is what happens. You approach transcendence and it destroys you. <sighs> yeah. Uh, and she's very, she does not, she does the least ecstatic transcendences mm -hmm. of any I've ever read, but she gets there and she just things, I mean, earlier in that story, sort of as, 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 as a foreshadowing, um, uh, the servant Gobile um, buries a crow, a uh, carrion, a crow in an anthill and presents the exquisite skeleton to Grieve's mother, who's, who's, who's so thrilled with it, she doesn't say thank you because she's elfin. But again and again, it's, let's take it to the point of dissolution um, and at the point where you see everything. Again, that's the story, that's at the stroke of midnight. She mm -hmm. takes it to that point where she is, well, beating the cloth of gold on the line, beating the dust out of it, beating the, the dailiness out of it and taking it as far as she can take it. And then just before, you know, as it, because it all falls apart, it becomes uh, amazing. Does that make sense to anyone? I think, I think it makes sense also that, I think, I, I like your idea of the uh, Hecate that you started out with, right? That yeah. uh, for me also attaches itself to relationships, right? So oh, that yeah. things happen, right? In this story that you uh, just described, for example, if I remember it correctly, uh, there is, of course, also the lover who is left behind, right, in this transformation, so that this is also a love that is being lost, right, and it's heartbreaking, right, it's, I think it really should be heartbreaking, it is heartbreaking, uh, but in this story, this is, so it is, right, this is what can happen, right, that someone has a transformation or something happens, right, something changes and someone gets left behind, right, um, and so it happens. It's very unsentimental. It is, uh, and I've been trying, you know, for you know years of reading uh, Townsend Warner. I've been trying to get at the affective or emotional force of these stories uh, in their looseness, right, or in their, you know, in their in their detachment, in their celebration of indifference, right, in their and so on. Um, and nevertheless, they pack an emotional punch, right. Um, oh, yeah. Where you think, but but your reaction is not going to be that you sit down and say, "Oh, let me weep with you." Um, uh, your reaction is going to be to say, "Yes, that that's well, that's life, right? That's things happen." Mm -hmm. And just, uh, yeah, and I think that's an I think that's an art, right? To to I mean, I think to 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 prevent moments of loss, of grief, of of at times heartrending grief, right, from becoming very simply sentimental or or something that you can weep along with right and nevertheless give them their their dignity or their um their due right um it's i really don't know how she does that i think you're you're the writer you're better at, at, at explaining how this is done right um because i just sit there and i'm i'm awestruck right and i think oh my god um how did that happen um because Yes, um, elfins are heartless, they're soulless, literally. Um, and how they deal with how they deal with us is to throw us away. Um, because they go through so many changelings, they go through so many favorites and lovers, and we have a very short shelf life to mm -hmm. them. And so they, they throw us out as, you know, just before we begin to spoil, <laughs> they throw us out and they throw us out. And yet, and yet 
Tifan at what 900 years old is still remembering um, uh, True Thomas. And she dies remembering True Thomas with whom she lived briefly in the moment and he would not let her think about anything else but the moment. And so she is remembering that single point in time that is the center of her nine, you know, her thousand years, center of her millennium is the brief time she spent with a mortal. Uh, and there are these relationships. I mean, uh, going back to, um, to Grieve and his servant, Gobele. Gobele, it's, it's a love story. Mm -hmm. he, he goes back after he's been cast out, they're all cast out uh, uh, mortals. Uh, he goes back at great pain through a plague and a famine to repudiate Elfendom and is taken back into the story, into Grieve's company. And he loves him, he doesn't understand him in, in the slightest and follows him. So there are, and I, and there is, I don't know what kind of reciprocity there is. Uh, she just, she just keeps coming back to the various ways in which mortals can interact uh, with elfins and, and sometimes it's wonderful, sometimes, mostly it's horrible. I mean, the, and, and it's, well, blackly comic. There's the entire royal pack of werewolves <laughs> that they have to have put down. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and also it, uh, her, her talent for embedded things. One of, one of the werewolves is named Duke Billy. And I keep thinking, I wonder who he was before he was a werewolf and before he was taken into the, 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 the elfin pack of werewolves. You know, there's a story there and whoever Duke Billy was, and you could write that story about the Duke of some, <clears throat> oh, Austro-Hungarian uh, uh, duchy and, and, and how he became a werewolf and what happened to him, but it's all embedded in the two words, Duke Billy. <laughs> yeah. And that brings me uh, to a question I wanted to ask. What ethnographic, what anthropomorphic details do you wish that Sylvia had written that she didn't? What are, what are we missing from Elfendom that you really want to, to find out about? Hmm. Ingrid? That's a really good question. Um, what is missing? Um, quite frankly, I can't get enough of them. So I think, she should, I think she should come back and write some more, you know. It's just, and, I, and I think she is the only one co who could actually have written these stories in that way, right? That's also this, there's this sui generis quality to her writing uh, that uh, that even the best of imitators I think would somehow fail because they put in the occasional moral value where it's not supposed to be or because they would somehow use emotive vocabulary where it's not supposed to be or because it's 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 very it's very very it's inimitable right uh, so I think I would uh, I would just love to have more more elfin kingdoms that she could have still invented right that 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 i think i would love to find out more about more places in elfendom um and uh, now we won't ever have them right so yeah. we have to go back to and, and and be satisfied with the ones that we do have yeah. i think i think that's painful that. and we did find some more stories right that that yeah. which i'm very happy yeah. for and of course when the book came out, that's the first thing I got. I thought I have to have a lot more elfin stories, right? And uh, it's it's uh, but it's it's finite, you know. And it's like it's like you know having some sort of really really great painter that you admire, and you just know that they only painted so many canvas canvases, and there's never going to be another one of them, right? And even the forgers won't know how to do it, right? No I mean, more vermeers. Um, no, actually, um, she gleefully 
uh, went back to it. Uh, she had finished um, editing um, Kingdoms of Elfin, and then she wrote um, Duke of Orkney's Leonardo, which of course, um, plug, handheld press is, has included in Of Cats and Elfins. And that is one of the very best, uh, in my opinion, of the Elfin st stories. So she did come back to it. She did, um, she did say, okay, I haven't done, I haven't done <clears throat> the, uh, the castle of wreckers on the Northeast Scottish coast. Let's go back to that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um and yeah there is oh my goodness um there is if i can find it uh yeah oh well never mind but uh she does let's see now there is i'm not gonna do this Okay. Yeah, go on, go on. But um, uh, maybe I could uh, while you while yeah, you're looking for it, in, maybe step in, step in. I kind of would like to open up another strand that we haven't talked about yet, and that uh, I find impressive also on rereading is how really she is a prodigiously a prodigiously learned writer, right? Extremely oh, well read. Oh, yes. In history, in literature, in whatever you might name, right? It's 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 humbling, right? And at the and same time she and, and at the same time she she wears it lightly, right? So that <laughs> Uh, it, it, it happened to me this time. I was reading, uh, reading the story of which one is that, right? The, the, the occupation, right? Where um, yes. and and we're in Scotland, right? And then suddenly, and, yes. and again, it, yes. it asks you to, it asks you to activate, then what you know, because they find, you know, an abandoned castle, and then in brackets, right? Uh, around that time, right? At that date, the Scottish border was peppered with ruined castles. Bracket. And you have a whole history of the uh, of the borderlands to fill in, right? And then uh, a couple, a, a little uh, further on, um, uh, suddenly we have a character who is being disturbed by uh, these invisible fairies, and it's Jamie Hogg the shepherd making his morning round, and who was perplexed and I think, oh my God, Jamie, James Hogg is here. You know what's he doing here? And uh, and uh, and but every one of these things then is ties back. To it, you know, if 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 you then know that Hogg is not only this Scottish um, uh, poet, but also the writer of something like you know the Confessions of a Justified Sinner, a dark, mm -hmm. um, a and gothic. Beatrice Shepherd, that was his pen name, Beatrice. Exactly, and he wasn't actually a shepherd, but he and 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 and, and it just it just blossoms out, and 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 the the. The, the the justified sinner book also has this meta level where in the novel suddenly hog appears as one of the characters and so on so you have this, this romantic version of postmodernism uh, going on there and you could just so i think you could write a whole you know little vignette on on what what hog is doing in this story and many of her stories open up on little moments like that and if you catch them you have one of those electrifying moments and if you don't catch them it doesn't matter you'll catch yeah. another one mm -hmm. right? so yeah. it's not this kind of i know better than you attitude right that says you know if you're not as learned as i am you know go and <laughs> go back to studying and read up or whatever you know get get an encyclopedia britannica first and read it a to z um or better still read everything that i've read um and uh but it's something that's there and it's 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 an offer and it leads somewhere it doesn't it's not that it doesn't lead anywhere but if you miss it if you don't catch it you actually don't lose the story in its entirety right you don't it's 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 a in a way a democratic way of of using what is after all a kind of an elite art right the yeah, knowledge yeah. of everything right so it's, it's completely it's... lacking an ego it's not an egotistical mm -hmm. set of yes being scored which you might get with another writer who might yes yeah yes. who would lead up to this magnificent point and if you don't get it well you've wasted the entire thing exactly you're and you're learning. just a, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. no it's not it's not name dropping right it's fun mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's true clear did you find the one you were looking for uh no? yeah um 
uh, <clears throat> I was thinking of, for some reason, her uh, elfin kingdoms seem to get kinder as she moves west. Uh, the Peris, uh, you know, uh, in Persia are really terrifying. Um, and actually the Welsh fairies, um, the, castle, the Castle Ashgrove fairies are lovely. The queen flies off to deliver a mortal. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, the woman is in labor. I'm not going in procession. <laughs> um, but that has, that I think is important because it has the fear. Uh, we have something, they have, they have all the time in the world and we have numbers and we have machines and their fear is we are going to win. <laughs> I mean, the harbinger comes. I mean, the harbinger comes in the form of a drunken midwife on on, on a on a bicycle, mm -hmm. which is kind. Of, you know, it's it's an engine of just it's it's an engine of destruction. It's an alien metal tangled thing that crashes in on them, and it you know it brings and she, that and her iodine bottle bring this terrible vision. Um, <clears throat> I saw trees blighted and grass burned brown and birds falling out of the sky. I saw the end of our world, Morgan, the end of Elfin. I saw the last fairy dying like a scorched insect. And okay, she does, there's apocalypse and there is, Yes, that frightens us too, but they are the natural world that we are, we are killing. They don't like being part of the natural world. They don't like, they, they don't, they're creeped out by wasps being cut in half in the marmalade. They're creeped out by insects because they recognize their closeness to them, um, their vulnerability. And yes, they make use of us. Yes, they they steal babies and and run through them. Yes, they hunt us in packs. Yes, um, they kill us lightly uh, when we're being uh, when we're being boring or um, obtrusive. But we can kill all of them. We're going to kill all of them. And that you know, just in that one place, uh, that fear is there. Their identification entirely with the natural world. Um, it's the bit where they're unimaginably old, they're older than humans, but, uh, and they scorn souls, but they're going to lose. They're, they're, they are in a eternal, you know, a almost endless time, but they're on the losing side. <laughs> and that's just that one place where she brings that out because they're so smugly on top of things for most of it. Yes, and I think that, that um, I mean, if I had to compare the uh, fairies with the humans, I think the difference is actually, is actually smugness on the part of humans, right? That, yes. I mean, the story about the, 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 the district nurse with her iodine bottle, right? That's done oh, not so cruelly, cool. but in the interest of progress and science and cleanliness and hygiene and all those wonderful values, right? So, it's, yeah. so there is a hypocrisy of that humans have that the fairies actually completely lack. Yeah. And, um, and, and I'd say that, that if I had to choose between humans and fairies in these stories, um, despite the fact that the fairies can be cruel, I'd say, again, it's an upside downish identificatory point of reference right i'd go for the fairies anytime and mm -hmm. with the fairies right because they lack exactly this inability somehow this this or the, the ability that humans have to present even their most destructive impulses as some as somehow good they are not hypocrites they are not hypocrites right humans, hypocrites. humans in the process of tidying up the world might you know eradicate a whole race of creatures um but uh but yeah. no, we're not bothered right we're, we're cleaning up yeah. i think with exactly. that, we could um, open the floor to questions yes, if anybody please. has a question um would you like to put it in chat or would you like, like to raise your hand so i can see 
um, while I'm waiting for people to assemble their thoughts and start typing, every time I read Kingdoms of Elfin, I think of Kipling, Pocket Book Sale Rewards and Fairies. And I keep thinking Kipling versus Warner. You've got two sets of fairy human interactions and there is a similarity between them. But Kipling has the fairies in need of humans. But Warner's fairies really could live without humans completely. They, there is no need there. Would you agree? What do you think? Well, my uh, all time favorite is Fox Castle, right? Yeah, okay. If I had to read a story again and again and again and again and again, I think it would be that one. And that one is exactly about that, that we have a human who makes it into the fairy stronghold. And for a while, they're interested in him. Uh, he, it seems that he becomes an object of a kind of a mild form of scientific experimentation, but not really mm -hmm. uh, very energetic. And then they just leave him alone. Well, they forget about him. They ignore him. They forget about him. They don't care mm -hmm. about him. They they almost don't see him. Right? Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. he's he's in their cabinet of curiosities. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are, you know, he's one of he's one of their many passing interests. They well, measure like a pet, him. a pet that somebody was given and forgot about. Yeah, so not yeah. just for Christmas. Uh, <laughs> It's not just for Christmas. <laughs> but that's for him, and that's the best thing, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is. The story he spent his life longing to see fairies. Mm. That is his great, great, great wish. And they take him in and they treat him. They mean him no harm. They mean him no good. Mm -hmm. They measure him, they play with him for a bit, and then he wanders about the castle disconsolately until the queen actually literally, cast, I love this, she casts him off, she's knitting, and she simply casts him off. He's not in the pattern anymore. Plain pearl, plain pearl, and out you go. Yeah, yeah. out you go. And yeah. he wakes and finds him on the, the cold hill side in another century and, and, and mad and old and confused. And that's it. You've had your fairies. You see, you wanted fairies. We gave you exactly what you wanted. You got your fairies. And yeah. What? Yeah. Be careful. Be careful. Yeah, but at the same and time, he's I happy like there, right? Kinder. Kipling is being much kinder, but then this is for children. He's being moralistic in a way. He is being much more careful about leading you through the lessons that, you know, the historical lessons that you should get. Whereas um, in Warner, the historical references are, you know, as we said, offhanded. You know, if you want to, you can go, oh, Hogg, James Hogg. Um, Kipling, uh, Kipling would give you a lesson on James Hogg if he, if, if he needed to. And it would be a wonderful lesson on James Hogg. What? And there would be moral would... values because Kipling was big on moral values too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any questions well, then? People in the audience, has anyone got anything to ask? Oh, here we have one from Hannah. Do you think all the stories have the same narrator in Kingdoms of Elfin? The same narrative voice? I should out us, out us. Hannah and I, we know each other, right? So, and we've, <laughs> we've discussed this. Um, We've even discussed the option that the narrator could actually uh, be uh, an elfin rather than human, right? Um, so, um, and uh, I've spent some time seriously trying to investigate that that, that intuition, right? Um, do I think that they all have the same narrator? I get a sense that yes, in my in my sense, I always he seemed to hear the same voice, but maybe maybe that's me, Greer. Um, I think it's. Warner, but it's Warner's inner elfin. Julian likes that. That's actually an excellent idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's um. It's not a question that's ever occurred to me. Is it the same narrative voice or is it the same narrator, which suggests that I have not thought that there could be more than one. It is the narrator, and that's who it is. I don't know who the narrative voice is. 
I'm not, I would not be convinced it was Sylvia herself, but I think it's a pretty stable narrative voice across the stories. And they were written in a fairly short period of time. It's only about three years, three to four years, mm -hmm. 72, 75, and then a few after that. So it's not as if she was writing it across a very long time and lost the voice. And pretty much that was all she was writing. I wasn't, I don't think she was writing very much other than the elfin stories during that very intense elfin period. Well, I think was she, was she, she was editing uh, Valentine Acklands and mm -hmm. her own letters, right? So yeah. I think you have this, on the one hand, this this mo this period of grief, right? Um, mm -hmm. And on the other end, you have, on the other side, you have these stories, right? And mm. I don't know how they... Hmm. Well, it, yeah, they nar narrating the grief, narrating her way out of the misery she might have been in, but also exploring almost mm -hmm. ecstatically Greer. She's almost ecstatically exploring what it might have been like to have had a completely different existence with Valentine. Mm -hmm. That's something that Yeah, and to also I, I think I think I mean it's it's ages and ages ago, uh, um a while ago that I taught a rather weird seminar um, where uh, we brought together writers at the end of their lives, you know, very, uh, you know, Ooh. not not young anymore and knowing that life is going to be at some point finite, right? And we asked not how do, the, what do these people think about death? Uh, we asked very simply, what kind of art do they produce, right? And for me, the Kingdoms of Elfin is one of those works, right? That someone writes late in, in life and what, what you get, I think, is a uh, a honing of skill, not not a collapsing of it, but actually the 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 the, the sheer mastery of someone who's done this all of their lives, right, mm. and who is good at it, right, and who now embarks. Um, that's how I was how I was imagine her now embarks on yet an, on a project, right, on yet another project, right, in the midst of grief, right, saying okay, there is somehow a horizon that I can still march towards, and I do this with all the skill that is at my disposal, right? Mm. And it's considerable, right? And I think that's also where the narrative voice comes in, right? The narrative voice is one of the, 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 the tools or one of the, 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 the ingredients which she uses in order to put together these artworks. So I'm, 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 yeah. She's almost possessed. Mm -hmm. They take her like a possession, and this is something as a writer. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes a story will possess you. Mm -hmm. um, I I have stopped in the middle of crossing busy streets when a story uh, possesses me, and I think, and being Warner, it's a very, it's a very cool possession. She's not frantic with it. She's not scribbling, but she's allowing herself. Oh, I don't know. She is. She is. She is. She does have that inner voice. She is looking through the eyes of an elfin, but it is also very recognizably her voice and. In the beginning, it was her voice I fell in love with. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, from the very first story I read of hers, I said, I trust, you know, I trust this voice. I am in the presence of someone who can, it's it's like being taken by the hand by um, Mary Poppins. This is not, you know, when I a child, I like that too, because this is a cool, unemphatic dispassionate presence and if you trust her she will show you wonders mm -hmm. and again this goes this is back to my childhood but it's still there is that voice of someone who knows the world she knows whatever world she goes into she knows london she knows the english um countryside she knows all of the kingdoms of elfin uh, she she is placed wherever she goes and can you know can she sees it well she talks about it well and it is always recognizably her voice she is a musician she did start mm -hmm. as a composer 
Yeah. And she said, um, I think to Vaughn Williams, that he said, why didn't you go on? And she said, um, you know, she, she had a voice as a writer. She, she felt that her voice as a, as, as a composer was borrowed, but her voice as a writer was her. And that's, that's what I feel, even when she's, even in these stories, when it's a, it's, it's a different key of voice, say, or a different mode of voice, mm -hmm. it's still recognizably her voice. Yes, I think that's undeniable. We have another question. Um, is, well, Ian asks, is it possible that Townsend Warner was a precursor of or might she have influenced Ursula Le Guin? Yeah, I was just thinking about, yeah, I saw it in the chat, right? So, <laughs> Ursula um, Le Guin made a, a pilgrimage. Uh, lucky person. I wish I could, I wish I could, I wish I'd had the nerve, but right at the end of Warner's life, like in 76 thereabouts, Ursula Le Guin made a pilgrimage to, to Dorset. She did. she did. She did. She did. And, and she was appalled by the smoke. The entire place was absolutely saturated in smoke. <laughs> but I think there's, oh, yeah. some, there's something in that... Le Guin isn't as dispassionate, but she was a lifelong Taoist. And there's something in that taking things exactly as they are, as they come, mm -hmm. that I think they have in common. Also, you know, also the world building, the absolute knowledge of whatever world they're in, including ours. And Le Guin was more often in our, in, on this planet but they both also knew exactly, you know, they did not fudge anything. Everything, everything was built, everything was there. You could walk mm -hmm. onto it. You could, you could turn around and, and see everything. You could hear the alien yeah. birds. Um, but yes, uh, I think there must have been because Le Guin did, did make that pilgrimage. Yeah, Ingrid, what do you think? My sense is that Le Guin, I mean, I'm now thinking of, um, you know, The Left Hand of Darkness, which is my all time Le Guin favorite. So, um, um, and I think you do get a sense of making the reader an observer, right? And of the whole assembly, right? So both of all the observers themselves as well, right? I, th I think we're meant to uh, look at both that alien world that we encounter there, but also at the human observer of that alien world, and we're not supposed to take sides, right? I think we're, we're supposed to become our own ethnographers, if you like. Um, mm. But I think at the heart of that story is uh, uh, the question of communication, right? Is it possible to communicate across a gulf of of such massive difference, right? That uh, that uh, the differences can't even really be adequately gauged, right? By the different players, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's something that Townsend Warner doesn't focus on. I think she she focus she tends to focus on uh, where two people are concerned on the question: How can these? How can there be love um, between two people? or entities or whatever, right? Um, in which they can let each other be, right? In, in which they are not going to use each other as each other's mirrors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's what, that's what keeps interesting her, interesting her again and again and again and again, right? I mean, probably the best case of that, of course, is um, Mr. Fortune's Maggot, right? Uh, where this is itself thematized, right? Um, as, a, as a problem. And I think Le Guin goes the other direction and, and, and insists, okay, that there must be communication. So what can be the conditions in which communication can emerge? And from this maybe something like love, right? Mm. And it seems to me that's almost the opposite obsession, right? Um, um, Interesting. Does it, one is interested in finding out how people can let each other in peace, right? How, how we can... Be, uh, how we can be in love and nevertheless not take possession, right? Yeah. And uh, the left hand of darkness is interested in how we can find each other and talk to each other and understand each other in such a way that we really do understand each other. Right. We have one well, final question. Um, Cleo asks, 
Could uh, Townsend Warner have been influenced by Karen Blixen's more gothic or weird work? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I have never read Karen Blixen, so maybe I should read up on her. Ingrid, expand. Oh. My my sense is that yes, actually, just to, just today, just before we met uh, today, I thought I kept thinking of Karen Blixen um, uh, in her gothic stories, for example. And I think what what they share is this quirky, eccentric uh, investment in also um, exploring, let's say, older historical layers, arist aristocratic societies, for example, aristocratic. Uh, worlds that appear to somehow work differently um, and again where the morals of the of the world isn't at all clear mm. so so I think actually uh, if if I were to do a class on these eccentric writers I think they would be in one group right I need to find out about Karen Blixen are these stories in print do you know yeah, they should be. Um, um, one is called I think seven gothic stories uh, uh -huh. Claire, I think you remember um and it has it has one magnificent story and they're also all of them vaguely queer or many of them are vaguely queer in a, right. in, a, in, in the genuinely queer sense right so they're as just sexually dislodged odd uh mm -hmm. a thwart right whatever the the the, the various words might be uh, so they're not identity pieces right uh, and in one of them for example there is an abbess of some sort of Protestant convent, if such a thing is even thinkable. Um, I think it's a Protestant place. Uh, and she, nightly, she keeps transforming herself into a, into an, an ape, right? <laughs> and her her uh, nephew comes to visit her, and he's been running away from some sort of uh, scandal uh, at the court, where we think the scandal must have involved some sort of sexual misbehavior, maybe with a member of the same sex, and they then come together and then there's a love affair and all of this explodes. It is a very crazy, weird, weird world, right? It sounds and, absolutely uh, amazing. Right, yeah. I need to look this in, need to look her up. But I think now we have to finish because we're coming to the end of our hour and one hour on Zoom is enough for anyone. So I would like to thank Greer Gilman for, very much for your contributions and also Ingrid Hodge Davis. And that was the last handheld book club for this season. So thank you very much.